Hello everybody, welcome along. My name is Benjamin Bloom. This is the Benjamin Bloom Football Channel and this is the dearly departed review for game week four and wow, <laughs> what a game week four it was. This show is covering those teams that broke the code, that got out of the championship. I am a championship YouTuber but we will continue to follow and provide content for our friends at the teams that managed to get out. They are in their glory, all five of them, from last season, Leeds, West Brom and Fulham, and from the prior season, Aston Villa and Sheffield United. And it was quite the week for our teams this week. I did not expect to be doing a show like this on Dearly Departed, but let's just enjoy it, because I think we all know what's coming, especially when it pertains to Aston Villa and Leeds, who... Just had a magnificent weekend. Uh, before we go any further, we need to say thank you to Jay. Jay is our fan sponsor for the Dearly Departed series. He is sponsoring every show throughout the season. Jay Coyle, Dearly Departed, also known as Ben Couldn't Bear to Lose Us, marching on together. Thank you so much to Jay for his support. Thank you to all of you for all your support. And if you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button and ring the bell for regular notifications. Let me pull my keyboard a little bit closer and we're going to get into this. Here are our results on just a balmy weekend. Um, conspiracy theories abound about the amount of goals. Are the lack of fans causing a lack of focus or a sharper focus? A lack of focus for defensive teams, a sharper focus for attacking teams? I don't know, but that is an ungodly amount of goals. Four, six, two, four, two, three, one, three, seven, nine. Wow. Um, let's look at our teams. Leeds won. Manchester City won. We played out what the um, options of this game could be. Well done, Leeds. Guardiola and Bielsa duking it out there. Southampton, two. West Bromwich, Albion, nil. Not good. Uh, where's our next one? Wolves 1, Fulham 0, Arsenal 2, Sheffield United 1. And then I can't believe I'm about to say this down the bottom. Aston Villa 7, 7, Liverpool 2. That is how our five teams got on this weekend. The split continues between Leeds and Villa performing well and the others struggling a bit down the table. Um... I try and make all my content unbiased. We're going to look at the facts. But obviously, as we're doing this, I'm only covering five teams. So I do want them to win, let's just say, in case there's any accusations of bias here. And by God, did Aston Villa win. Unbelievable. I looked at this game. I thought, OK, Villa beat Sheffield United 1-0. Fine, there was a red card after 10 minutes. OK, Villa, <clears throat> excuse me, beat Fulham 3-0. Fulham's defending was hopeless, wasn't it? And uh, Villa maybe in second gear. Well, they definitely hit sixth gear plus turbo plus everything in this game. 7-2 against champions Liverpool, world champions, recently European champions. Uh, amazing Liverpool team under Jurgen Klopp takes an absolute battering at Villa's hands. Uh, the Villa team, well, a little tweak. Uh, the back five, the same as we've had. Martinez, Cascons and Mings target. It's normally been Douglas Luiz sat in front of the back four with then two midfielders uh, getting a bit of rotation as a tight central midfield three. The idea here um, that Sofa Score are presenting is that maybe John McGinn was a little bit deeper to allow new signing... Ross Barkley to just operate a little bit further forward. If you read Rude Hullett's book, he's very good on this, about uh, the Dutch style with the one main striker, the midfield three. It's a triangle. Do you have one holder and two ahead? Or do you have two holders and maybe one ahead, which allows that one to maybe do a little bit more? Is the attacking output of the one more than one and then two kind of halfway forward? Who knows? Um... Depends on the players in the system, but that would seem to be what he's done. Grealish off the left, Trezeguet off the right, Ollie Watkins up top. 
Um, Liverpool, yes. Two big players out. Sadio Mane and Alisson, the goalkeeper. But still, come on. Adrian, Trent, Gomez, Van Dijk, Robertson. Keita, Fabinho, Wijnaldum. Salah, Firmino, Jota. It's still an unbelievable team. And this is an unbelievable game. And I'll try and um, talk about the pattern and the game state because we know Liverpool press and are so risk, um, risky in terms of how high up the pitch they play. But their players are so good and their pattern of play is so strong that that's never really a problem. What we get in this game is Liverpool uh, forward, 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 Villa attack, exploit that and literally just score every time they attack. It's incredible. So there is the opener, Oli Watkins' first goal in the Premier League. Uh, we've covered him on the channel for Brentford last season. He was a winger the season before, one season up top for Brentford. 25 goals, I think, in the championship. Here he goes, off the mark in the Premier League. Grealish plays him in for his first assist. And you can see... Van Dijk running back towards the goal. This is going to be the first of many times that Villa are going to turn Liverpool around. And of course, Liverpool believe they can beat Villa. So every time Villa score, Liverpool double down. They're like a gambler um, losing a bet and then just putting more and more money down to chase the bet. And the bookie just keeps taking them to the cleaner. Watkins for 1-0. Here is Watkins for 2-0 coming in off the left-hand side. He's going to put that one in to the top corner. Sensational stuff here. Uh, Mo Salah, he looks at it this season, doesn't he? There on the left foot. Smashes it in. 2-1. And again, you have this sense of a stretched game that Jamie Carragher talked about so well on Sky. That Liverpool don't want to play this system in a stretched game. They want to play it where they're essentially hemming the team back. We've heard about the counter press, the Gagan press. When the game stretched, this system can be exploited. They've done it so well over the past two, three years now that nobody's managed to do this to them. But wow, 2-1 uh, anyway. Keep up. Now, uh, Villa are going to get a little bit of luck on a few of the goals. Look, we can uh, delete all three of the deflected goals and say they still win the game 4-2. So there's no, they didn't win the game because of deflected goals. But it was just one of those days and Villa fans drink it in enjoy it, where all of the deflections run for the goalkeeper and just fly in the net. Brilliant stuff. So there is John McGinn hitting that one with the left foot. Look at number four, Van Dijk. That's going to hit him. Send Adrian the wrong way. And let's try and keep up. We are 3-1 Villa now. So yes, bit of a lucky goal. Um, here is another example though of just uh, look, again, look at the way all the Liverpool players are facing. They've been picked off and counted again. Uh, it's dinked over. And Watkins, good teams create big chances. That is a free header from two yards into an open goal. They've cut them apart. My God, it is 4-1 Aston Villa. I think they had 26% possession. They just destroyed them on the break. So it's 4-1. Yes, here comes another. I mean, of, of the three deflected goals, this is probably the least lucky because um, it's going to hit. Is that Trent there from Barkley's shot? And Adrian is still, he's not totally wrong-footed. He's still going to get a good look at it. It does sail over his head into the top corner, though. 5-1. Damn. Uh, there is Salah. What a player he is. He makes it 5-2. Probably the only one who can not hang his head in shame in this game from a Liverpool point of view. Um, here comes Grealish. That is going to deflect off Fabinho and totally wrong foot the keeper, Adrian, for 6-2 we're now up to, aren't we? And I will repeat, yes, two of the deflections were very lucky. One was quite lucky, but the win was not lucky. Let's just be very, very clear about that. Uh, and here is Captain Jack. Look at that, just completely clear through. Again, Every time, and Jamie Carragher, um, I would never profess to know more than him about football, so I will happily use his words. They didn't at any point just step back and say, guys, we've lost. Uh, maybe that's a strength, but this was just heinous weakness <laughs> in this game because they're still up on halfway trying to score. 
And it's one ball through and Grealish, obviously, a player as good as Grealish is going to, um, in a 1v1, stick that one in. 7-2. My God, 7-2. Um, 30% possession for Villa. 18 shots to 14, though, in their favour. 11 shots to 8. Four shots uh, off target to 1. Uh, two, no two corners to 7. So we know exactly what the game state was here. Um, through a mixture of very good tactics, very decisive finishing, a little bit of luck on some of the deflected goals, and um, the system just working beautifully, um, the plan just working a treat, plus Liverpool having a hopeless day. Villa just smashed Liverpool. And anyone who watches the channel know, I say every video, big chances are revealing. Six big chances to Villa. Six. This is the champions conceding six big chances. Look, uh, Liverpool themselves had four big chances in this game. Just a mad, insane game. Two eight five passes to six fifty, where uh, the game stay and Villa's tactics and performance just crucified Liverpool. It will probably not happen again to Jurgen Klopp at Liverpool. I wouldn't have thought it will. Just one of those days where everything. It goes perfectly in the game plan, executed perfectly, and then the players are a foot taller and the other teams are a foot smaller, and you can just see the context and the situation just playing into Villa's hands, and boy, did they exploit it. Unbelievable. If you're a Villa fan, as I say, drink it in, enjoy it. Villa fans, don't expect to win every game this season, but they won three on the trot. Brilliant stuff. I asked questions after the first two games. I addressed the mitigating factor of the red card to John Egan in the game against the Blades. And the game against Fulham, I addressed the mitigating factor. But, hey, I'm hands up here and I'm all over Villa on this one. Unbelievable. Three wins on the trot. 7-2. Okay, we all know that this will regress to the mean at, at some point. But... <laughs> Look, I'm going to throw it out there. Carragher did say as well, he does a great uh, clip on YouTube of Carragher, that with the with the weird situation we've got this season, could we get another Leicester? Could we get a weird top four or a weird champion? I'm not saying Aston Villa are going to win the title. All I'm saying is if Carragher is right, Leicester only avoided relegation at the last the previous season and won the title. I, I, look, I'm going to stop myself there before this gets more and more ridiculous. Obviously, Liverpool will probably still win the title. Who knows how this season is going to pad down. But let's just bask in the mentalness and say congratulations to Villa fans. Aston Villa 7, Liverpool 2. Wow. Really enjoyed doing that. <laughs> and I'm really going to enjoy this one. Leeds 1, Man City 1. Now, please go back and watch my video preview in this game because I laid out a few scenarios how this could go and I was right about one of the scenarios. I laid out, it'll be open, uh, Man City you have got uh, elite players and elite boss and they'll win 3-0. I laid that out as a scenario. I also laid out, it'll be open, we've got two fabulous managers who play this beautiful football, both of them, it will be end to end and it will be a draw. Like Athletic Bilbao versus Barcelona. <clears throat> that happened. And the other one I laid out was it will be crazy. It will be open. Man City will have an off day and Leeds will win. <clears throat> so those were the three game states we kind of looked out. Yes, I'm sure I'll get in the comments. Oh, Ben, you're covering your backside with all three possible outcomes. But we kind of knew the way it would happen rather than just the results. No one would have predicted 7-2 in the other game. So, um, I didn't watch the full 90 minutes. I've watched the highlights. Apparently, this was just utterly brilliant. Uh, just two teams banging the passes about attack, attack, attack. And we said there would be a sense of both managers knowing that the other was a complete, complete purist who would not surprise their opponent with a, a low block and playing for set plays. So, they were confident to just let their teams go out. And I'll try and watch all 90 minutes at some point during the week. We're in International Week. But apparently, it was an absolutely beautiful spectacle. There is your Leeds team. Settled across the back five again, like Villa. Uh, Meslier, Aileen Cock, 
Cooper, Dallas. Phillips obviously sat in front. Click and Roberts is the midfield too. So Rodrigo not starting, but he's going to have a really nice impact on the game when he does come in. Costa down the right. Uh, as I forgot in my... Um, yes, I am allowed to forget stuff. I forgot. Obviously, Harrison is still on loan, isn't he? So he's blocked from uh, playing against Manchester City. I forgot. I'm covering 30 teams this season, for good sake. Don't don't beat me up on it. Pat Bamford up front, who is scoring, scoring, scoring this season. Manchester City. Uh, Diaz makes a debut there. Edison Walker, Diaz, Laporte, Mendy. Foden, Rodri, De Bruyne. What a player. Torres. Mares Sterling. <laughs> just, just brilliant. What a great job I have here. And look at this. Uh, Kevin De Bruyne. Can you see in the bottom of the picture there? He thinks he's Joe Bryan in the playoff final. Tries to catch Mesley out with um, a free kick there. Hitting the post from miles and miles out. Now, this is not a narrative that I'm perpetuating because I'm doing Dearly Departed. Watch all the chances Leeds are going to create. My God. First of all, though, Sterling's got to score the opener. Missed that one out. Great player, Sterling. He comes in off the left. <laughs> Look at Luke Ayling, number two. He knows exactly what's about to happen here. Sterling's going to stick that one in the corner. 1-0. Manchester City. But, as I say, Leeds are going to play through Guardiola's Man City and create a whole load of big chances in this game. Here is that Stuart Dallas, isn't it? In the six-yard box. Good save by Edison coming out. And if he can... Be a hard finish there to get the dink or slide it under him. Just uh, good goalkeeping, I think. Look at that. Stuart Dallas. I think it was a mistake from Mendy, who's on his haunches in the back of the picture. But look. Seven yards from goal. 1v1. My God. Here's another one. There's Rodrigo. What is he about? Eight yards from goal. Difficult angle. Three in the box. Look at the chances they created in this game. This is the actual goal, which um, actually took a mistake from Edison in the goal. Splashes the corner down and substitute Rodrigo there. Wraps that in. Another huge chance that Leeds have managed to wangle. Maybe a bit of a mistake there. This is a pretty difficult chance, but still, again, Leeds are playing Manchester City. You've just scored hundreds of points over the last three seasons, I think. And Rodrigo there heads that into the top corner. And it's a great save by Edison to tip it over the top. So, look at these numbers. And this is where um, I can be a little bit smug, I have to say. So, Leeds, 52-48 on the possession. Uh, 23 shots to 12, but look, in uh, sorry, Man City's favour. Look, 7 shots to 2 on target for Leeds. 14 of Man City's shots were off target. Seven corners, uh, 10 corners to seven in Man City's favour. Now, I say on this show every week, big chance stats are very, very revealing. And I had a few thin-skinned Leeds fans in the first few games when I counted up the big chances. Because the big chances, and I'm not saying we should just look at them, but they are revealing, as I always say. The big chances in the first game against Liverpool for Leeds said Leeds finished brilliantly, but frankly, the big chances were heavily in Liverpool's favour. And on another day, Liverpool could have really beaten Leeds quite handily. But it was 4-3 and Leeds were in the game. Okay, In the next game, even stranger, the big chance count went in Fulham's favour. And Leeds won the game. And I pointed this out. I said, I didn't watch the game. I've watched the goals. But the big chance count is always revealing. And... My statistical view, my universal overarching view is that good teams create lots of big chances and don't concede many. Whether that's through passing and pattern of play or getting the ball in the box, however it happens, that's how you win football matches. Then we went to the Sheffield United game and it was very tight. I think it was like one big chance apiece and Leeds won that game uh, through their pattern of play and they hammered away and they got the victory. So... Look at this one now. Leeds, five big chances to nil against Guardiola's Manchester City. So, with my read on this, I say this is really, really encouraging for Leeds. Really encouraging. Because what this is starting to tell me is that this is very sustainable. 
Leeds' performance is very, very sustainable in terms of them not just finishing... I, th I think I've been predicting sort of 10th to 16th or something. This is viable that they can win a fair amount of games this season, is what I'm saying. And to the Leeds fans that uh, said, Oh, Ben, none of the, none of the pundits said that, that Fulham were even in the game, but you're talking about the big chances. You cannot now talk out of both sides of your mouth. I'm letting you have this stat. Look at that. Five big chances to nil against Guardiola's Manchester City. I didn't watch the whole game, but on the evidence I have seen, and you may have seen more as a Leeds fan or a Man City fan, Leeds should have won this game. They created a load of big chances. Manchester City didn't, and it's ended 1-1. My eye test on a small highlights package says they should have won. The numbers say they should have won. Look at that. 4-2-9 passes to 3-8-9 against Guardiola's Man City. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. And we were confused after the first two games. 4-3 defeat, 4-3 victory. That's not helpful for people like me who like to see solid evidence. And I'm getting solid evidence that Leeds are very, very viable in the Premier League. They've played four games. They've lost by one goal to the champions. They've then won two on the trot, including a tight game against Sheffield United. And now they've gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with Guardiola's, um, I was going to say Barcelona then, Manchester City, and created five big chances to zero. That's enough evidence for me now. Look, this could change, but if I am a Leeds fan, I am extremely pleased. Forget the first two games, but with the last two games, a tight game and a win through pattern of play and a clean sheet and a tight game against an elite manager with elite players at a gigantic uh, Premier League-sized, <laughs> certainly budget-wise and money-wise club, and they get the draw and they should have won. This is really good for Leeds and I'm very, very happy to see it. Go the dearly departed. Come on, Villa and Leeds. Superb stuff. Now, God, we're 22 minutes in. It's going to be a long one today, given what's happened. We're going to take a bit of a turn in narrative when we look at the other three dearly departed because it's not going so well for them. First of all, West Brom. Well, they are outside of the relegation zone. They did get that point against Chelsea. They went to Southampton and they were beaten 2-0 here. Goals by Gineppo and Romeo. Let's have a look. First thing we'll notice if we've been following West Brom closely all season, the back three is gone. So I'm actually quite pleased about that. I thought uh, maybe this was Bilic's plan all the way along. Look, we'll try and bleed ourselves into the Premier League season and we'll go a little bit tight and defensive the first few games. And also look at the opponents. It was Leicester who finished high up, didn't they? Chelsea and Everton, who were, who were top of the league. Maybe it was horses for courses. Maybe he thought, look, after three games, perhaps I'll go to what I was doing last season, which was the 4-2-3-1, and try and let your three off the front, particularly Dan Garner and Pereira, do the damage. I think West Brom are more viable for having a good season with this system than the three in the back. However, they didn't score any goals in this game, and they did with the more defensive shape. Look, obviously I know about team shape. Team shape is just team shape. It doesn't dictate philosophy. Jose Mourinho's, there's a brilliant clip of him talking about this. It doesn't matter what formation you play. You're going to play a very attacking formation with no, uh, sorry, a very attacking philosophy with no strikers and six defenders. Or you could play a very defensive philosophy with three strikers and a 3-4-3, three, three, say. So it's all about the pattern of playing the philosophy, let's just say. But... I prefer to see that. So it's a back four. So it's Dara. No, Dara O'Shea is still there. So it's Furlong that's gone out, isn't it? Johnston, O'Shea, Ajay, Bartley, Townsend is the back four. Livermore and Sawyers as a double pivot. That was very productive last season. And so was the three off the front. Although it's Kyle Edwards that gets into the team. Pereira, Dean Garner, obviously, and Callum Robinson up top. So if I'm a West Brom fan... I'm probably quite pleased they've gone back to that. But obviously, I'm not pleased about the result. Uh, Gineppo, there he's done a lovely Cruyff turn just before that to step back 
and he's going to get... The amount of times we do these freeze frames and it looks for all the world like the striker's never going to get the ball through the gap. But they always do, don't they? And into the corner. That one goes. Sadly, who is that playing everyone on side? It's Kyle Bartley, isn't it? That maybe Johnston's a little bit unsighted there by the striker who's... Is that Che Adams? Uh, who's, who is on side. So he can... You know, he can stand there, frankly, if he wants. 1-0 there. Uh, this was a great goal, I have to say. Chipped in from the left. That is Romeo arriving and hitting that full on the volley. That's just one of those ones where... Is that Che Adams again? Where you do just hold your hands up and you say, great goal. I suppose the worry is chance creation. And I won't look at Southampton here, but 39% on the possession. Five shots, two on target. No big chances created. That's my worry because we've looked we've looked back at the five goals they had scored. Two absolutely brilliant goals against Everton. Great, but it's not sustainable. You can't can't score worldies every game. And then the three against Chelsea. Well, that was more sustainable, wasn't it? And Callum Rowe, I think one of them was a particularly good finish, but the others were big chances. There's my worry there. And no big chances created in that game. 3-2-5 on the passes. This uh, just looks more like uh, not quite good enough. So let me know if you're a West Brom fan in the chat. And I go back to what I said. Are West Brom more viable as a 4-2-3-1? Were they in the game more than the other games? I mean, 3-0 up against Chelsea, frankly, weren't they? And that was still the three centre-half system. So be interested to know what West Brom's fans take on that or would be. Are they more viable with the system he's played in the first three games? Or should he now go back to what he did last season and persist with this type of thing? Southampton 2, West Brom 0. OK, <laughs> here we go. We're going to have to get our rule book out for this one, aren't we? Arsenal 2, Sheffield United 1. The Blades lose again. At least they get on the score sheet. Uh, Dave McGoldrick scoring there in the second half. It was already 2-0 at that point, though. Saku... And Pepe had scored. As usual, the three at the back there. Basham, Egan, O'Connell is out for a while. So Robinson may get a fair amount of minutes. Bulldog and Stevens are the wing backs. Osborne, Berger and Lundstrom. So still Fleck, Norwood on the bench. Up top, it's still Burke and McGoldrick. He's being stubborn with this selection. Let me know, Blades fans, if you think he's being too stubborn with this selection. Could he tweak a little bit? Because you do have... As I said, Norwood and Fleck on the bench to pep up that midfield. And, obviously, Billy Sharp, McBurney to pep up the forward. They keep losing, but here it comes. There is a big mitigating factor in this one. So, I think this is really early in the game. Maybe a couple of minutes into the game. Correct me if I'm wrong. This is David Luiz and Oliver Burke. And David Luiz is pulling back. Oliver Burks. To, to play the situation out, that picture is very, very damning. It's a, it happens really, really quickly. Louise makes the mistake. Burke is now going through. You can see uh, the keeper way, way out of his goal is going to come and sweep up. Louise has a quick grab of the shirt. And so we are again in red card mode or not red card mode. Now, one thing I must say really, really quickly... Let's deal with this decision. I know it's going to be irritating as hell for Sheffield United fans that John Egan got sent off for a pull and denial of an obvious goal-scoring opportunity in the first game. So, Blades fans will be thinking, there's been a tight one go against us there in a defensive play, and now a tight one go against us here in an attacking play. But what is really, really important here, if we're going to do proper analysis, the situation cannot be, and I know you don't want to hear this, Blaze fans, but it cannot be, if Egan was sent off, then Louise should be sent off. That we, 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 that's, that's not the debate at all, is it? Let's be honest with ourselves, unless David Louise and Ollie Burke and the keeper here are running at exactly the same speed, Exactly the same distance. The ball is exactly the same uh, trajectory towards the goalkeeper. The goalkeeper's moving exactly the same distance as in the game. You see what I'm saying? 
It doesn't necessarily follow that just because Egan was sent off, Louise should be sent off. Now, that's not to say that it's not a red card here. We'll look at that in just a second. But the debate, and I get it. I get the frustration. I really, really do. But the narrative here is not if Egan got sent off, Louise should be sent off. No, come on. We've got to be more sensible about that. We've got to, It's a different game. It's a different decision. It's a Every one of these situations is totally unique and we can't do one versus the other. We just have to look at what we've got and we have to look at the laws. So the laws say you will be red carded for denial of an obvious goal scoring opportunity. So we are again in IFAB semantics land, aren't we, of what constitutes an obvious goal scoring opportunity and has David Luiz prevented one? So what we're looking at, and Graham Souness did a really good, I know Graham Souness gets pelters for being a little bit of a dinosaur sometimes. He did a really good job of this and I have to say he had a better camera angle than this. He had the angle from behind and he did it very simply, much more simply than I've done it. And he took this freeze frame and then he took the freeze frame of when the Arsenal goalkeeper clears the ball. Now, when the Arsenal goalkeeper clears the ball, Oli Burke is, I would say, less than a foot away from him. Now, this is where it's totally different than the John Egan red card because we didn't have that information, did we? Oli Watkins stopped running. So we couldn't play out the scenario of, well, where did Burke get even with the pull? And the answer, I think, is very damning for David Luiz because Burke is only about a foot away from the ball. That would seem to imply that had David Luiz not pulled him, i.e. David Luiz pull has slowed him down enough to stop him reaching the ball first. And obviously, if he reaches the ball first, it's a goal-scoring opportunity. So... My interpretation of this is that David Luiz should have been red carded. Now, I wish I had the still, I don't have it, of Oli Burke and where the keeper clears the ball. Because I think that's the most damning thing here. So I think David Luiz should be red carded here because Oli Burke seems to only be, as the, as the game plays out and we see what actually happens, he seems to be close enough to the ball to suggest that he may well have had an opportunity, even if it was to slide it. Um, it doesn't say in the laws a denial of a guaranteed goal. There's no such thing as a guaranteed goal. It's an obvious goal-scoring opportunity. If he gets to the ball first, that is an obvious goal-scoring opportunity because it's a it's a 1v1 shot with, a, with the goal gaping, isn't it? So my feeling is that David Luiz should be sent off not because, <laughs> and this is the really unfortunate thing about the John Egan one, we didn't get it to see it play out. He, uh, Egan pulls Watkins and Watkins stops. So we don't get to find, which is actually quite clever, isn't it? And we don't want to see players diving and simulating. But maybe if Burke had actually gone down, maybe Louise had have been sent off. I, <laughs> I don't want that to be how we end up playing football in 2020, but maybe that's the case. So... I get accused of sitting on the fence. Here is my view. David Luiz should have been red carded because the evidence when the Arsenal goalkeeper clears the ball is that if he hadn't have pulled back Oli Burke, Oli Burke would have reached the ball first, ergo, and had a goal scoring opportunity. Please, please, in the comments, let's just frame this correctly. Can we talk about this decision though? Because my take is also the John Egan red card is very frustrating for Sheffield United fans, but utterly irrelevant to this decision. It's frustrating, yes, but the co any kind of comment that says, and look, I believe in free speech, you can say it if you want, I think you're wrong, but any comment that says, because Egan was sent off, Louise should have been sent off, I understand your frustration, because one seems to have gone against you in an attacking sense, and one seems to have gone against you in a defensive sense, but the, the, it, there's a disconnect. Just because one happened doesn't mean, it's a completely unique situation. However, I do think, and I wish I had the shot, and Graham Souness did it very well on Sky, I do think Louise should have been sent off. Therefore, there's another defeat with mitigating circumstances for Sheffield United, where they've had to play um, in a game where they should have had the advantage that Aston Villa had when they played 
against, um, and yeah, I am making the comparison to the game state now. Aston Villa had that advantage. Maybe Sheffield United should have had that advantage and would have been playing 10 v's 11 for, or 11 v's 10 for most of the game. Okay, dealt with that one. Here are the goals. Nice one here for Saku. Good football. Uh, down the right-hand side, chipped in and he heads in on the back post. This is a great goal as well by Pepe. Drives in from the right-hand side. Hugely frustrating for Blades fans, obviously. And sticks it in because you feel, if you're a Sheffield United fan, that you'd earned yourself an advantage in this game. And 11 v's 11, Arsenal do still have some very good players, don't they? Pepe's one of them and he produced that moment of quality. Um, as an Ipswich fan, I obviously sit in disbelief as I see David McGoldrick in the Premier League at Arsenal on the edge of the box, curling one in with his left foot. It's a mixture of pride because he was always an excellent player. You could see he was a technically really good player. Pride and happiness for McGoldrick that a good player is getting to do something and that how rotten it's been at Ipswich. At least somebody's succeeding who'd been at Ipswich in the last 10 years. And it's a mixture of pride and amazement because we just couldn't get him fit. Couldn't get him on the pitch for any more than 10, 15 games in a row. But good luck to him. It's a great goal by McGoldrick there. And it ends 2-1. And it's highly, highly frustrating for you Blades fans. Look, 64-36 on the possession, but uh, six shots apiece. Arsenal five on target to two. One big chance to zero. Uh, heavy on the passes, 700 to 373. Uh, Wilder wouldn't be too bothered about that, given the, the big chance count is revealing, as I, as I always say. And again, just a huge mitigating factor now. Sheffield United are going to be looking at a couple of these games now. They're going to say the Leeds game was very tight and maybe Leeds edged it and you hold your hands up and say on a different day we could have won. But the other two games they've lost, because they've lost four now, they're going to say Egan red card. Well, that went against us. A subjective decision, isn't it? And that's it. When we're commenting as well, please remember this and please respect other people's opinions. It's subjective. There is no black and white. Offside is now black and white, isn't it? Has the ball crossed the line is black and white. We can't argue against it. If you're a millimeter offside, you're offside. If your ball's a millimeter over the goal line, it's a goal. If it misses by a millimeter, it's not a goal. Black and white. Red card, subjective. It's a matter of opinion as to whether a John Egan denied an obvious goal scoring opportunity or a David Luiz denied the goal scoring opportunity. So I can understand. People coming down on either side, please do not let your bias for your team cloud your reasoning. My opinion, my honestly held opinion with good intentions and no bias, I support Ipswich, hey? We're playing in League One against Milton Keynes. Um, <laughs> my honestly held opinion with no bias is that David Luiz should have been sent off. I have no agenda. The most offensive comment you can make to me on my YouTube channel is that I have an agenda or I'm not being honest. You are wrong. I have no agenda against David Luiz, against Arsenal, against John Egan, against Sheffield United. I have no agenda. I call it as I see it. Agree or disagree on subjective stuff. Don't tell me. Go tell me I had an agenda the other day. A Swansea fan told me I had an agenda against this team. There's many things um, I can be called, but dishonest, no. <laughs> Absolutely not. Unlucky to the Blades, but the defeats continue. Although there does still seem to be some sense that it could swing the other way. Which we cannot say about Fulham at the moment, can we? There seems to be some hope. West Brom are outside the relegation zone. The clock stopped now. They're not relegated. Sheffield United, we can call out some genuine mitigating factors and genuine games that they've been in. Fulham, it's not looking good. I'm not finding any kind of argument to say this is going to get any better. Which is worrying. Because we all like going to Fulham, don't we? We all like going to Putney when the stadium's open back up. They got the promotion. It's not going well, is it, at all? Uh, this is what Scott Parker's come up with. They're going to lose 1-0 over at Wolves or Porto or Mendes Wolves, whatever you want to call it. Wolves are a formidable opponent, though, with Nuno and Mendes and Neves and Jimenez. And Bolly, all those players we've come to get used to there. Fulham. Well, Michael Hector is the victim, and so is Dennis Adoy, of the embarrassing 
Aston Villa game. Ola Aina plays at right back, who I thought played really badly in the game against Brentford, which we did a watch along of. So <laughs> Parker trusting him over Dennis Adoy at the moment. Also, Joe Bryan is out. Max Lamarchand came in during the Villa game, but this is a new broom. We saw last season Rodak, Adoy, Hector, Reem, and Brian. Reem has survived, but he's been out of the team this season as well. Now we see Ariola, Aina, Reem, Lamarchand, and Robinson. So, as a football fan, and I said this about Sabri Lamucci at Forest a couple of weeks ago, I look upon things like this and I worry when you see, we know, we all know the phrase, I'm not going to swear, but throw enough SHI at the wall and hope some of it sticks. And in the absence of any clean sheets or any good defensive showings and the Fulham sporting director ridiculously tweeting about how his centre-halves are not good enough and how they really want to sign some, I would worry about throwing it against the wall. However, this is statistically the best defensive showing, isn't it? Because they only conceded one goal, so... There you go. Up the top, a little bit more stable. Kearney, Anguissa, Cavaliero, Reed. Oh, excuse me, Joe Bryan is there. He's playing front left. Wow, sorry. Didn't spot him there. My point still stands that the back five is very, very different. Excuse me. Don't bother commenting on that. I, I understand I'm an idiot for not spotting him there. You don't have to tell me. Mitrovic, obviously, up top there. So some sense that Parker is saying here, I trust my double pivot. I trust my attacking players and I'm happy to tweak per game. I do not trust my defence and my plan is that I'm going to try and find a formula in defence and this is going to work and we'll score enough points to stay in the division. Seems to be what he's saying. Look down at the bottom there as well. Adamola Lookman, who had a really nice cameo against Brentford in the watch along in midweek. Also, Naiskin's Cabano is definitely not far away from that first team. There's real solid arguments that he should be in the team based on output and certainly my eye test, whether any football professional would give a crap about my eye test, but there you go. There is the winning goal. It's Neto and it's a really good finish actually. Fires that really direct and straight along the ground through the crowds. The blocks are not going to connect and it's going to fly in the corner. Ariola, not much chance there, but look at that. Mitrovic has squared that to camera who, look, he can either give the keeper the eyes and slide that to his right and find that big hole there. You can see even in the still, he's moving across to that side. Or just a nice uh, bending shot, right foot. I suppose you'd call it Thierry on refinish. Look, okay, high standards. Yes, I get it. But how many Fulham fans, put your hand up, would prefer if Camera can complete the pass, that to be Camera squaring it to Mitrovic rather than the other way around. So big chance there, missed at the end. Let's look at the numbers. 53-47 in possession. We know Fulham possession stats always come with the caveat that we used to have the drinking game last time. Take a swig every time I say Hector, Reem or Reem, Hector. A lot of passes between the back and often... Not the most productive, let's just say. 14 shots to 10 for Wolves, 5 shots to 2 on target, 6 corners to 2. Two big chances to 1, big chances are always revealing. 5-2-4 passes to 4-7-8. If I'm a Fulham fan, I'm looking at this and saying this is the most competitive Fulham have been this season. It's away at Wolves, so maybe things are improving. Look, it couldn't get much worse than that Villa game, couldn't it, where they were hopeless defensively and weren't competitive in any way, shape, form or fashion. They were competitive in this game. So maybe there's a positive there, but it's not going great for Fulham, is it? Get your thoughts in via the comments if you're a Fulham fan. Do you agree with how Parker's going about this? Would you like to see Lookman and Cabano in, like I'm suggesting? Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. And what the hell is the best goalkeeper and back four? Stick it in the comments. Here is your league table. And we have dearly departed teams in second place and eighth team and eighth place, excuse me. Let's revel in the fact Aston Villa, unbelievable. Three wins in three, nine points. Look, will it last? <laughs> I doubt it.
But let's just enjoy Villa being up in that top four. Brilliant stuff. Three wins from three. They've even got a game in hand on other teams tied with them on nine points. Good <laughs> game in hand on Arsenal and Liverpool, who are also on nine points. What a start for Villa. Give me your thoughts, Villa fans. And sometimes we're very analytical on the channel. And I always say the best thing about football is the emotion. But never let it override the facts and the evidence. But maybe screw that at the moment. <laughs> Let's just, if you're a Villa fan, enjoy the emotion. Let it override the fact that this may not last. And just look at that league table in your second place. There still seems to be a sense, though, that the most viable of our dearly departed teams might be Leeds, who are in eighth place. They've conceded eight goals, but in the last two games, they've won 1-0 and drawn 1-1. Caveat against Manchester City, the draw. Something tells me they may be the most viable of our teams. I may be proven wrong. Aston Villa may have a sensational season. Who knows? But... If I'm a Leeds fan, I am very, very pleased with those first four games. And particularly in the last two games, we see plenty of evidence to say that that position may not be that much of a pipe dream anymore. If I'm a Villa fan, I'm dreaming. I don't think Villa are going to finish second. If I'm a Leeds fan, I'm starting to add up the evidence and saying, well, hang on a minute. We played Liverpool and Man City in this first four. We've played Fulham and Sheffield United, OK, who are the bottom two. We will know more about Leeds in the games between sixth place there and 16th, although 16th is Man United, frankly. But you know what I'm saying. The proof is in the pudding. At the moment, of all the dearly departed teams, I think the most viable for a finish... <laughs> You could argue that some of the teams lower down might be viable for the positions they're in at the moment as well. Hopefully not. But I'd be happy if I were a Leeds fan. I would be really happy. And we It's transfer deadline day today. I'm recording this 10.20 at the moment. We expect maybe some more investment to be made. Now, looking down the bottom there, West Brom in 17th position. Is it viable that they can avoid relegation? Burnley have a game in hand. I always do like to go by the logic of stop the clops now, West Brom stay up. So that's always a good starting point. They seem to have gone back to the 4-2-3-1 from last season. I'd like to see some action today. Maybe up top. Maybe at the back. I don't know. Can Bilic bring in a more experienced Premier League operator in that back seven? Really, other than Jake Livermore? I'm thinking about it, yeah. There, there isn't much Premier League experience there. Do they need that just to help them through? Is it viable that they can stay in seven teams? They've got that one point, though, and that is more than the next two teams we're going to talk about. Sheffield United, of all my dearly departed teams here, feels like there's far more of an opportunity for results to come up to performance. If you're a Villa fan, you're worried about well, certainly not the last game, but you're worried about results coming back to performance and you regressing. If you're a Sheffield United fan, you're more optimistic, maybe than a West Brom fan or a Fulham fan, about performances and results starting to reflect performances and some points coming. That would be my take. They could have got something from the Leeds game. It was tight. Leeds took it. And they had a couple of red card decisions gone in their favour, they could have taken something from the other two games. Let's write the Wolves game off now. Two behind after seven minutes. We can't excuse that. But the table doesn't lie is a well-worn football cliche. And they're in the bottom two with zero points. So Chris Wilder is a brilliant manager and he's a realist. So he'll tell his players, for all of those mitigating factors, you got no points, lads. So we'll see what transpires coming up for Sheffield United. I would be more optimistic were I a Sheffield United fan, though, than a Fulham fan. Where, OK, maybe they were most competitive here in the game at Wolves. But four defeats, three goals for 11 against. Parker fishing for defenders. Tony Khan fishing for retweets by the look of it. 
Let's see what deadline day brings. And let's see whether Fulham can be in any way viable or whether they're going to be in 20th for all season. Because if, frankly, let's be honest about it, and like I say, I've loved going to Fulham in the Championship the past t seasons they've been down. Great place, great club. But if they can't make an improvement in the defence or the players can't make an improvement as the season goes, then it's the most logical thing in the world. They will finish bottom. And that would be your worry, isn't it? The, needs, the players either need to pick up, Parker needs to get a better solution out of his squad, or they need some new faces, or they're going to finish bottom. I think that's fairly sound logic, isn't it? So let's hope they can do it with our dearly departed hat son. Wow, I've gone really long. Sorry, 50-minute show here. Um, but I've thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope you have too. Let's bask in a 7-2 victory for one of the dearly departed and... The other one going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Guardiola's Manchester City. Please interact over here on YouTube. Hit the like button. Hit comment. Subscribe. Ring the bell for notifications. If you support any of these teams, review, preview every week. Great fun. Been getting great action. And my plan is now going forward to clip the individual games. So if you want to just look at your team, well, that's fine. Up to you. Watch the whole video though as well. Why not? Uh, join the Fantasy League. We'll be looking at that. Oh, we can look at that tomorrow. We'll do a review there. T5QBR0. You can listen to all of these shows over on the podcast feed as well, which I haven't updated in a few days. I do apologise. I will do that. You can support my ventures. Help me out. It's international break and I do mainly championships. It's going to be a struggle. So we've got 12,000, nearly 400 subscribers. That's amazing. Thank you to each and every one of you. It's not enough for me to make a part or full-time living yet. So we've got a few other revenue streams here. Amazon.co.uk slash shop slash the Benjamin Bloom Football Channel. Buy anything from any of those lists, I get a little kickback. Patreon, $3 tier over at Patreon. You, um, you're basically a, a donation to support the channel here for the price of a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or a pie, hopefully, at the football when you go back. You can support a fellow football fan trying to live the dream here for the $3 tier. The $5 tier, not only do you support me, but you get some extra content. My Q&As, you get privileges on the um, actual Q&As over on the channel and with our guests over there. Your questions will be asked first. And you get Patreon exclusive content, my vlogs, my Q&As, and my behind the scenes videos. Now they're not going up on YouTube, Patreon only when I was at Reading Barnsley behind closed doors, my match experience there, and I was at Norwich versus Derby. Don't know how many more times we'll be able to say this. I saw Wayne Rooney bang a free kick in the top corner to win a game. What a great career that guy's had, and I was privileged to be there. I know I'm privileged to be there behind closed doors anyway, but privileged to see one of the greats, frankly, do his thing. You can also sponsor the channel like Jay Coyle has done. Thank you so much, Jay. Dearly departed, also known as Ben. Couldn't bear to lose us marching on together. Thank you, Jay, for your sponsorship. If you want to be a fan sponsor, we still have the Fantasy League. We still have the Ask Away videos as well. I think everything else has been covered, which is amazing. If you run a small business, you can sponsor the whole channel. Okay, thank you so much for watching. I went a bit long. I hope you enjoyed it. But hey, it's international break, so we need as much content as we can as we can get out. Wow, what a weekend for two of the dearly departed Villa. 7-2 winners. Leeds going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Premier League big boys Manchester City there. They went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Liverpool as well, didn't they, earlier in the season. West Brom outside of the relegation zone. As it stands, long may it continue. Sheffield United. Signs. Some signs that the four straight defeats... Could be pushed in the right direction. Fulham, a little bit more worried down at the bottom there for them. But go the dearly departed is all I will say. Thank you everyone for watching. And I will see you on the next video. Over and out.